If you love classic cars, then Donald loves you. Donald, tell them what we're driving. Jay, today we're in a 2023 Porsche GT4 RS, which uh, of course by actually Porsche nomenclature is a 718 right. GT4 RS, otherwise known to most mortal as a Cayman. Right, the Cayman. And this is the true mid-engine Porsche as opposed to the rear-engine Porsche. For those that don't know, rear engine is generally described as with the engine behind the axle mid-engine is in front of the axle fair to say absolutely and uh jay we seem to have uh we seem to have entered the age of the mid-engine car either the rear mid-engine or the front mid-engine um it's something that the engineers have uh, decided does give the best weight balance and proportion and handling and uh it's really interesting too because for how long did the cayman live in the shadow of the 911 well, it still is, actually, when you think about it. Everything is in the shadow of the 911. The thing that strikes me most is we're filming here in Rhode Island. I would say it's probably, what, 35 degrees today? Yes. Mm -hmm. Beautiful day. Is being cozy in a sports car. You know, I grew <laughs> up in New England, and I remember my friends would have MGBs or TR3s. You put the plastic windows in. And then a friend of mine got an MGB GT, which is basically just an MG but with a hard top roof and roll up windows and a heater that worked. And oh, it was so, it was so cozy to drive, you know, on a day. -to -day. And that's what's fun about this. To be cozy in a sports car is not something that happens in California with the exception of maybe for a month in, in March and February, whatever, where it's actually cold. You're just always trying to get the heat out of the car. You know, you've got the windows down and, and, and that's great fun. But there is something nice about being cozy and warm in a car like this when it's outside, when you're outside, because now the car is working as it's supposed to. You know, in California, you've got to have air conditioning on all the time and all <laughs> that kind of stuff. And that's making a lot of heat and robbing horsepower. Whereas this, the cold weather actually improves performance because the air is denser. So exactly. You, you, your car feels crisper, you know. It is one of those things too that, that sort of brings me back to the fact that Porsches, especially 356s, were regarded as everyday cars. Right. I love those those publicity photos of people driving their 356s up to the mountains to ski. Right. With the ski racks on the top and 356 in the snow with the benefit, of course, of uh, the traction that the rear engine gave. Right, right. Um, so it is very interesting that, uh, of course, they were probably bundled up inside because the amount of heat that 356 put out was not terribly much. But. I don't know if you remember this, but there's a hilarious ad and it's not that old. Some photographer in New York was doing a fashion ad and he had a 356 and he had the rear hatch open and, and the model was putting her suitcase in there. You know, <laughs> you go, to keep it warm. How can this guy not know what's, what, what, <laughs> it was just, it, 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 people were like in hysterics with that ad. And I think they finally told the guy, get the engines in there. You know, yeah. <laughs> just go to the back of the car and put your bag in, hon. Yeah. You know what's interesting about this? The first time I truly experienced a mid-engine car at speed was the new C8 Corvette. Mm -hmm. Because the old Corvette is the final iteration of the front engine rear wheel. And when I got in that seat, I, I realized that something I'd never noticed with the, C8, with the C7 or any of the earlier Corvettes, I was turning from the front. With, with the mid-engine car, suddenly the car feels like it's turning from right here, right here with the yes. gears. And right. I, I was like, whoa! I mean, that was so amazing, the way it, 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 it's such a handling improvement. And I thought the C7 handled fine, mm -hmm. you know? You, you kick the tail out and all that kind of stuff. But how much was over the front wheel until I drove that C8 and I realized, oh my God. It, it, it is a very interesting thing, too, because, again, a modern mid-engine car has such incredibly sophisticated suspension characteristics right. that you really can't get into a, the kind of trouble you can get into with a rear engine car or a, a very heavy engine, front engine right. car. I remember though that there were times when mid-engine cars with not a lot of power, like I had a, a Lancia Beta a Monte Carlo Scorpion. Right, right. And terrific car, not a lot of power, but a lot of people got into trouble with it because 
it had st it still had snap over steer right um, because of the fact the car pivoted on itself and people weren't prepared for that the front end got light all of a sudden and you know yeah. you're going in directions you didn't want to go in and you say not a lot of power I think it's fair to say no power <laughs> I mean the, the American version that was so strangled it was something what 80 horsepower yeah it had about 80 horsepower in the, in the at, standard at American time, version and I'm not talking way back you're not you're talking late 80s early 90s when a couple of hundred horsepower was the norm. Well, it was a little earlier. It was, it was yeah, mid seventies, mid seventies okay. car, and the mid seventies, of course, we all know what was happening with emissions right, right. Uh, controls. They were sort of feeling their way along, um, and again, you know, it's. it's <laughs> but they were selling them well into the eighties and nineties. Because yeah. I remember I looked at one. I went for a ride. And I went, what does it doesn't do anything? I mean, it, it didn't feel European at, at the handling certainly. Well, well, mine, mine did, and. Since I'm no longer a resident of California, I can talk about this freely. Um, but it was amazing what um, those cars did, even with the emissions controls removed. Yeah. And then the next step, of course, to get it back to European specification, which was about 150, 160 horsepower with a car that small and light, was yeah. pretty good. Yeah, that's very good. Um, but it's also another measure of how far we've come. <laughs> this. Cayman, you know, we talked about the fact that Cayman is always in the shadow of the 911. This model is the closest in performance to a 911 that the Cayman has ever had. Right. And I've always been a fan of this car because to me, this is sort of the kind of car that I think of when I think about what a Porsche should be. Yeah, it really is. I mean, and I think to the uninitiated who are not uh, Porsche aficionados, they think it's a 911, don't they? Right. The shape is so... It's got a great family resemblance. Right. Um, and, and frankly, in a way that it, it actually almost relates more to the original... It actually relates more to the original 911 than the current 911 does. Uh, the steering is very sharp. The handling is very sharp. Now you're in sport PDK Sport mode, right. so also the shifts are... Uh, really crisp. Does this come with a manual box? It does not. Uh, <laughs> why would they not make this? They they make the 911 with a manual box. Why would they not make this with them? This this is such a fun car to drive. Uh, the steering is really amazing. The handling, I mean, it just feels like you're in ballet shoes, you know? Yeah. I mean, you, look at that. It just, yet it's comfortable and it's extremely tight. It doesn't wallow on the road in any sense. And you just get the feeling it'll turn on a dime, literally. It's a funny thing that uh, they've also managed to, again, I can't wait to get behind the wheel, they've also managed to tune the chassis so that it feels very taut, but it doesn't feel jarring in any way. You no, know? right, exactly. You're not having your kidneys punched at every moment. It's very, very, very impressive. And they, the engine is, they, they used to say, lusty. You yes. Know? That's one of, they don't use those terms anymore for whatever no, reason. No, well, uh, it's, it, they're just not family friendly, Jay. Right, you know, that's, that's, that's uh, what you, 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 well, well, that was my thing, thing, you know, whenever you talk to Italian, <laughs> the car's like the woman, you don't jump on, you must, you must uh, finesse the car to get it to do what you want. You know, they always put it in these, these sort of sexual terms, it always made me laugh. And you wondered what the female drivers had to say about these cars. And I love the rev matching as well. Yes. It. It's got a great sound too, you know? And the fascinating thing about these automobiles now, they are so beyond the capability of the average driver. Yeah. You know, you never... You know, I've got that P1 McLaren, and I love it because I know I'm never good enough to find its limits, so it's always a challenge to me. I always feel like I'm learning something every time I take the car out, you know. You never you never outgrow it where you go. And you're like, if you got a Miata, great car, one of, but after I say, well, I, I just want something with more horsepower, you know what I mean? Uh, and it's funny, too, because it's about, as you said, exploring the capabilities of the car. When people do have track day cars, my idea of a great day at the track is being with a really great instructor right. who is teaching me the things that I need to do to get a little bit more out of the car, to learn the car a little better, to feel what the car right. is going to do, rather than sort of driving to the track and driving around as fast as I can. Um, because as you said, it's a matter of 
being able to work to your maximum because that's what we're going to hit, our maximum. We're not going right. to hit the car's maximum. You right, know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's what always makes me laugh. You know, when I would drive around with, you know, Sterling Moss or any of these guys, <laughs> which is always a great fun. It, oh, it sounds like you need two more pounds of pressure in the front wheel. I go, I'm, I'm driving around, what's that flopping noise? Oh, you got a flat. Oh, I got a flat. I mean, I didn't, you know. Go, oh, okay. You know, you realize how good. Because to the average person, like my friend Bill Maher, who doesn't believe mm -hmm. it, not a car guy, he goes, what's so great about race cars? They're just driving. Everybody can drive. You know, it's like saying everybody can sing. Yes, right. they can, but not well. <laughs> I mean, this is where you appreciate. You know, this is what I love about a car like this. Just what we just did. We're going at legal speeds. Mm -hmm. The exit speed is maybe 35. You're going 45 or 50. It feels like 25. I mean, it right. just carries itself. You never feel like, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. You know, when I, whenever I take my old stuff out from the 30s and 40s <laughs> and... Like the speed limit on the exit is 35. If you're going 36, <laughs> the bias plays are screaming and like, whoa, hey, hey, you know, and you realize that's what they were made for. Yeah, it is. It is a thing that um, when you go from car to car, you have to be very, very mindful of what you're doing because there are some cars like this where you can approach a decreasing radius uh, highway ramp and think, ah, it's fine. Just give it a little more throttle, just turn the right. wheel in a little tighter, and it's fine, you're done. Right. In other cars, it's like, oh, maybe yeah. I should have uh, applied a little bit more brake back there. And uh, you realize how much effort went into the, like this steering wheel. I like a thin wheel. I don't really like a thick wheel. And this is the perfect compromise. I mean, you have to have a thicker wheel for safety and all that. Right. But it feels, and it's got places for your thumb, you know, and it's exactly the right diameter. I enjoy my 356 because it's got that big wooden wheel that I exactly. like. But this feels just perfect. It's it's amazing how you could come up with something that probably suits just about everyone. I don't know. I'd be curious to meet someone who didn't like this steering wheel because it just feels exactly right. Well, we'll find a place to uh, pull over and I can sample the delights. That will never happen. <laughs> you want to try it? Yeah, I'd love to. But just the idea that obviously we're on public roads in a small town and, you know, you don't want to be irresponsible. But you can really enjoy this car on these kind of roads at normal speeds. It is such a pleasure to just touch the wheel and it does exactly what you want it to do. Well, Jay, you know? everybody who watches the videos on this network knows how both of us feel about this. The fact that, I will speak for myself, but I think that you share this emotion, yeah. that the cars that please us most are the cars you can get the most out of in all situations. Right, right. Cars that, if you want to push them, you can, but you don't have to. And yeah. then, of course, there's nothing worse than a car that you want to push and then it doesn't do anything for you. <laughs> well, as I said, this is my first time driving a Kim, which is hard to believe. I wow. think it is. I may have driven one before, but certainly not this model with no. this much horsepower. I mean, boy, it just makes... <laughs> and that induction noise. That's part of the loudest yeah. induction noise. And this is normally... Well, that, correct. That's the special thing about the GT3 normally RS. Aspirated, normally aspirated, right? aspirated. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And it just... I mean, no other car makes that <laughs> induction noise. Legally. Exactly. So the engine must be so quiet, they're able to trade decibels, you know? I believe that uh, one of the testers uh, actually measured, I think, 102 decibels in this car right. on maximum revs, which is... Uh... <laughs> Boy, that's pretty good. Yeah. That's, that's very good. I mean, it's interesting you say that. You just said, I love a car where I just turn the wheel and it does it. And it seems so simple, but it's amazing how many cars really don't do it that well. No. You know, <laughs> and, and this is very, very good. Is this electric power steering or hydraulic? I don't know. It, it has the feeling of electric because it's so incredibly immediate. Um, I'll have to check but, that but out. But hydraulic is always considered to be better, at least it used to be. I know on the new McLaren Arturo, they've really emphasize the fact that it's hydraulic power steering 
because it gives you the most feel. Correct. So, I think that people reacted a lot to the initial, the inaugural electric power steering systems that were very artificial and didn't have any change in weighting, right. which you get with the uh, hydraulic system. But I think that they've really progressed so much in the development of the electronic systems that... Uh, yeah, and plus, I'm not ashamed to admit, I can't tell. You know, it's like being a stumble here. There are people looking like <laughs> sip wine. Oh, this is from the West Hill uh, on a Thursday. This grape was picked. And they know that. But to me, like I said, I go... I, 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 you mean your sense of steering terroir is not very highly developed, Mr. Leno? Well, I, I think it is until you get to someone who really knows it. And then you go, oh, okay. Because I rarely push a car to its limit. For example, I'm not someone that... I never use launch control. I always feel like I'm, I'm twisting metal for no reason. You know what I mean? I mean, I like go along at four or five miles an hour and nail it and then take off as opposed to just shredding tires from a standing start. That really doesn't interest me because I just feel like it's like bending a coat hanger. Eventually that axle is going to give way, at least in my mind. I mean, Yeah, you, you sort of have X number of times to actually right. do that. Right. Um, I, I, the first car that I've ever bought that had launch control is my new Ferrari Roma, and right. I confess I've not used it. Yes, yeah, and um, maybe you use it once or twice to see what it does, and then you go, oh, okay. Okay, oh, it does that. Right, right. And then the axle drops out. The rear <laughs> drops out. Yeah, that's amazing. This is a terrific car. Again, it just cements my love for the Cayman. It's, it is funny how you become prisoner to your own heritage, you know. <laughs> I mean, I think, I, I'm not saying there's any uh, hint of authority. I think this handles better than a 911, don't you? Yes, I do. I agree 100%. Um, or at least to, to the novice driver, to the average driver. I mean, a good 911 guy can obviously, they win Le Mans and everybody, you know. Sure. They, they, uh, but I mean, if you're buying your first Porsche and you want the best handling you can get, this is pretty amazing. And this is a car, again, you mentioned the Miata, and it seems strange to talk about Miatas and new expensive Porsches in the same breath. But there is sort of a connection that you get with this car, like you get with a Miata. You know, it, it, it feels, right. I guess, again, I, I've come back to this before. Manual gearboxes are great. They're fantastic, but I can't shift faster than that. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's just the reality. Well, you know, the fun thing is, when I'm driving, I'm only racing myself. Right. And I have a great time. And then, you know, I remember I was up on the crest in Los Angeles. I, I've got one of the Suzuki H2s. That's, it's a motorcycle. It's got about 205 horsepower. Just crazy. And I'm flying along, and I'm doing... 85, 90, 100, maybe 100 times. Oh, this thing is really. And all of a sudden, boom, 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 guys go by me. 120, 130. I go, jeez. I go, I'm not even in this club. You know, I realize, <laughs> you know, I, I, I have a good time by myself. Thank you. Exactly. And and again, that gets to the point. I've been driving in uh, in manual mode, uh, in automatic mode again. It's much better than I am. It does give you that, uh, you know, people talk about sort of that video game effect that yeah. you just sort of see the scenery start going by more and more quickly. And uh, again, it's, it's the song of the car. It just makes yeah, a great Yeah, you know, there sound. was an era where they thought no machine might equal man but never beat man. Right. I remember when uh, <laughs> the first computer came out that played chess. Right. They said there wasn't an electri enough electricity to power it to beat a true chess master. You know what I mean? It would take so much energy and, and, and work and, you know, <laughs> vacuum tubes and all the other things. That's what would be necessary to beat, you know. And you realize now you can do it with your iPhone. <laughs> it is absolutely remarkable. And, you know, that's where 
development just plays such an important part and understanding what your goal is. I think that's, Porsche's done a great job with this yeah. car and sort of understanding what their, what their goal was. And, and for that, I am intensely thankful. Oh yeah. I mean, this, I believe the first car, or the first transmission to shift faster than a man was the Chrysler Torque Flight. That was the one, because you'd go to the drag strip and got, what, what right. You, what do you? What, what? An automatic? It just seemed like. <laughs> what's the matter with you? Are you crazy? You know. This came all about your reaction time. If you can hook it up, yeah. Then you can beat the guy trying to go. <laughs> this certainly honors the Porsche heritage and legacy in a great way, and I think I'm really glad that finally they've allowed the Cayman to step up to its true potential. Right. Uh, no, I think it's fantastic.